Hello everybody, welcome back to Happy Little Diodes. Today we're looking at an Issue 3 Spectrum 48K. It's not in terrible condition and it does boot, but it is in need of new capacitors and a DC-DC modification. So we're going to focus on those things and go into a bit of detail. This is another donation from a colleague who saw that I was making all these videos and decided that this was the best thing to do with his specy. You might have noticed that we've been a bit specky heavy recently. This channel's not exclusively for Spectrums. I mentioned this in my last video. We've got an uh, Amstrad coming up, a couple of Ataris, and a special old rare computer, which I guarantee you've never heard of, or at least most people haven't heard of. But I think it is a historically significant computer, so I'm going to put some effort into making some good videos about that. Here's the serial for this one if anyone's interested. And I'm also noticing the gunk where the feet used to be. I guess that's just dirt and grime which is stuck to the old glue. We'll clean that out and put some new feet on. The faceplate on this has been stuck on with kind of thin double-sided tip which has perished. So we'll be taking that off, cleaning it up, probably replacing the keyboard membrane like normal, and then gluing it back on. It still has all five of its screws, so let's take them out and arrange them into a little triangle. You don't have to arrange them into a triangle, you might choose a different shape, it doesn't really matter. And let's see what we've got underneath. Keyboard membrane still attached, let's get that out. I can see already the original capacitors are in place, so like I said in the intro we need to remove them and put some new ones in. There's no DC-DC mod. TR5 has been replaced. We've got um, Texas Instruments 3 type open memory chips. The jumpers look correct. An original ULA. Hopefully that still works. That's a close-up of the CPU just because it looks nice. And there's our ROM and the jumper hats are also correct for that ROM. So let's look underneath. So let's put the last screw in our little triangle and then have a look at the bottom of the board. First thing I'm drawn to is the Z80. It's been replaced and interestingly whoever did it didn't put a socket in. Fair enough. There's the solder for TR5. Probably blew up partly because there's no DC-DC mod. There's a close-up of our Sinclair logo. Here's the text at the bottom. It seems to vary from board to board. Not too sure what it means. It's not important to us. And now we can start making our initial checks. I'm not going to describe what I'm doing in detail. If you look on YouTube, there's an excellent video that talks you through these checks, and I do recommend you do it on any specy you get hold of before you plug it in. I'm happy with the results of those tests, so let's plug it in, and it works. Brilliant. So there's no repairing to do, we just need to do a refurb. The keyboard's even working, so I can do a quick test of the available memory, and hopefully we'll have 64k, yep, good. Definitely no repairs needed. I think I will still replace the keyboard membrane, but first of all let's do a refurb. Got this neat little kit and it comes with a set of capacitors, uh, good quality V-shape caps, so we'll pop those in, and the components required for a DC-DC mod. We'll go through these one at a time, so if you're doing the mod on your own specy, you can kind of do it along with the video. Before getting into the recap, I'm going to do a composite video mod, only because it's easier for me to test a spectrum with a composite video mod, and I do want to plug it in after replacing every capacitor or two, just to make sure I'm not doing anything wrong and I haven't broken anything. So we're going to desolder these two pins, and bend them over the case out of the way, and clear out the joints of solder, because we're going to put a 100 microfarad capacitor where one of those pins was.
Next we'll desolder this resistor from the output. I melted some of the plastic there which kind of looks cool but it's not a problem. And here's our new capacitor. You need to bend the legs in a particular way to get them into the joints. I always make a mess of it so I'm not going to show you my fumbled attempt to do it. And then we're going to solder the negative leg to the joint that we removed the resistor from like this. And the positive leg attaches to the board in the topmost joint that we desoldered previously. With that done I can start doing the capacitors. The way I do it is to clip one end of the capacitor and bend it up and then I can just heat the joint from behind and pull the capacitor out and then pull the remaining leg out. To actually remove the components I find it easy to pop the board into a desk vise, heat the board on the underside and remove the component by hand. I use tweezers or pliers to remove the legs because obviously they get hot and I don't want to burn my fingers. And then finish removing the solder from the joints. I had a bit of an epiphany while doing this specky that this is really really easy to do while the board is still in the vise. You can just heat one side and use the solder sucker on the other side and I'm going to do that later on actually for a tricky joint. And then we just solder them in and trim the legs and that capacitor's done. I really like it when the solder freezes. There we go, it's quite satisfying, isn't it? And we do that nine times, and then we have a lovely recapped board. I haven't recapped the one in the bottom right, because that gets removed as part of the DC-DC mod, as we're about to find out. Let's run through the shopping list for a DC-DC mod. You're going to need a 1 microfarad capacitor, a BA157 diode, a 2200 ohm resistor, a 22 microfarad capacitor, a 1N4148 diode, a 5V1 Zener diode, and a 220 ohm resistor. Most importantly, some good quality coffee beans. For issue 3 boards, you want to use a fairly coarse grind. Right, let's get to work. So if you're watching this to follow along with doing the mod, let's have a look at the schematics. This is the board we have now, and this is an issue 4A board, so two more generations on, and this is what we're aiming for. So let's mark all the differences on the schematics and on our board layout. The first big difference to point out is an additional diode and capacitor which attach to the left hand side of D15. So we're going to have to desolder the left hand side of D15 and attach these two components. Then we're going to swap D12 for a 2200 ohm resistor. D16 gets swapped out for a 1 microfarad capacitor. On the board layout the left hand side should be the negative. R54 gets replaced by a Zener diode D19 with the cathode on the right hand side. Another diode goes in place of R55, this time the cathode is on the left hand side. We then swap R60 for a 220 ohm resistor. Last but not least, as I mentioned earlier, we chop out C47. So let's get stuck into part 1. We're going to desolder the left hand side of D15 so we can attach a capacitor and a diode to it. So 
So I've removed the solder from the joint and I'm just going to pop it up. Be careful that the pin isn't going to catch on the board when you're pulling. If you have to apply a lot of force then you might do some damage. And here's our first capacitor to go in. That's C78 on the 4 row board. We're going to pop the positive side into the hole where D15's left hand leg used to be and solder it in. And then solder the negative end to the free leg of D15. Now we'll take our new diode, which is D17 on issue 4A boards, and solder its anode to a ground point. The right hand side of the empty C54 location is suitable, and it is hard to desolder these because there's a lot of solder around the ground joints, so if you pop it on its end and heat one side, you should be able to clear it quite easily with a solder sucker, a lot more easily than doing it on the desk anyway. We then take the cathode of our new diode and add it to our three-way junction here. And that completes the first step. That's the hardest step as well, I think, so it's all downhill from here. Next up, we're putting a 2200 ohm resistor where D12 used to be. Not the band, by the way, just this component. I'm using tweezers to just um, pull out the leg. I've already desoldered it. This is just to help it come free. It's always an option just to cut the legs, by the way, if you don't think you'll reuse the components. I mean, I probably won't, but I thought I'd uh, preserve them anyway. Here's our new resistor, and we'll solder that in place. Doesn't matter which way around it goes, obviously. Let's watch that solder freeze again. It's just so satisfying. Next step, we're going to remove D16 and pop a capacitor in its place. So like before, I've took the solder out and I'm going to pry the diode out while heating the joint. There we go. And we'll pop a new capacitor in its place. We're looking for a one microfarad capacitor and we're going to have the negative on the left hand side. Next up, R54 has to come out and we're going to pop a Xena diode in its place. It should look something like this when you're done. Yours should be neater than mine because mine doesn't look very good. Then find R55, we'll remove that and we'll pop D18 in its place. The last component to swap is R60, which is this one, and we're going to replace it with a new resistor at value 220 ohms. Finally, we'll chop out C47. That's all there is to it. So this schematic represents what we had when we started and after making all our modifications what we're left with is the equivalent of an issue 4A power circuit. 
Here are the component locations again, and I'll highlight them on this photo of the board as well. It might be worth taking a screenshot. So that completes a DCDC -DC mod. Next, let's have a look at this keyboard membrane. First, let's get the old glue unstuck with the heat gun. And we can see that the old tape is very yellow, very knackered. We'll scrape that off, it should come off quite easily, and stick some glue on in its place. Here's the old membrane. I know I said it was working, but it has packed in since then, so I don't feel bad about changing it. First of all, let's give it a quick clean. Now it's not essential that you snap your toothbrush in half while doing this, but I decided to do it this time. And that looks pretty good. While the new keyboard membrane's in the post, I just wanted to have a quick look at this nut. It's a bit rusty and I don't really want to leave it with a rusty nut in there, so let's give it a bit of an acid bath and see what we can do with it. I've left it for about 24 hours now, but initially I filmed it for 5 or 6 minutes. You can see the bubbles forming, which is kind of cool. This is sped up quite a lot. The bubbles show that it's working, and hopefully we'll have some nice shiny nuts and bolts afterwards. Let's see what we've got after two or three days in the acid. Nice. We can put it back together now and give it a quick clean. I think that white sticker is what remains of the original 48k sticker, so we might as well take that off. My replacement feet seem to have lost all their stickiness. That's frustrating that. I'm going to have to get the super glue out. Right, we're looking good now. The new keyboard membrane's in, so we might as well have a game of Frogger and call it a day. I'm getting better at this. Maybe next time I'll get past level 1. <laughs> 